Okay, so hello and welcome. Uh, time is now two o'clock in the afternoon in Sweden. Um, my name is Helena Blackknight. I work for Automation Region and likes to welcome you to uh, this uh, webinar on searching innovative applications for AI in additive manufacturing. And um, we have today invited um, Maud Sidiak from MXE to tell us about exactly that, how she has AI project manager at the Mexi works with these challenges and opportunities. And we've also invited uh, Fernanda Torre, who is CEO of Next Agents, and Petra Kugler, who's professor at Eastern Switzerland University of Applied Science in St. Gallen, who will join us for uh, a round table discussion on. Uh, the innovation management perspectives of what we hear later on. As I said, uh, I'm working for Automation Region. We are a um, um, center of, of uh, uh, competence in Sweden, uh, and we are focusing on, as you might figure out from our name, on automation and digitalization. We're located in an area called Meladolen region in Sweden, by strategic uh, reason, because here we have a, a a strong uh, cluster of automation research and automation industries. Uh, we bring together approximately 130 members and partners uh, from different types of organizations, both uh, industrial, academia, and the, the municipalities, the, the public sectors. And our focus is on helping our members, helping this, this network, this cluster to develop uh, for the future. And in my opinion, I think the most important thing that Information Region does is that we try to find ways to use uh, the shared uh, knowledge and experience and the networks of our community, because together we stretch far beyond the, the boundaries of Sweden and we have a very broad knowledge base. And building on that, uh, sharing knowledge and building on that, developing uh, knowledge together so that we can support the industry in its transformation from today into the future. And this transformation, as we know, is on everybody's agenda today. And moving from one state to another state, going through the, the steady state uh, into this more uh, turbulent state that we are into and moving into the future is something that very much requires that we work with uh, innovation management. And as uh, Maud will tell us a bit uh, later on, it could be in the form that she does, merging two novel technologies that we know will be very important in the future, but it could also be in other ways. And in our opinion, uh, innovation management is a very natural part of that, both when developing new novel uh, innovations uh, like new novel technologies or applying novel uh, things in, in our huge um, normal organizations. And that is the reason why we work together with ISPIM. <laughs> so ISPIM uh, is an acronym for International Society for Professional Innovation Management. And I think you can figure out why we use that very seldom in services, ISPIM. And this is the world's largest and oldest innovation network. We bring together about approximately 1,900 members from around the world, and we, uh, they come from more than 70 countries. Uh, as you can figure, we do a lot of activities during the years, but the major ones and those that uh, might be the ones that people learn is from are the three conferences we do every year. The large one when we can meet in, in uh, person is in Europe every year in June. And then we have two smaller ones, one in December in Asia Pacific and one in the spring in North America, I think March or April. What we've seen over the last 10 years is that um, the special interest groups that forms, um, groups where people with a specific area of interest within the larger uh, setting of innovation management come together and focus on things like that. They are growingly important and they are to a large extent forming the content of the conference and the activities. Uh, I am uh, running uh, uh, such SIG since I think 2017, together with a colleague from Canada called Stoyan Tanev. 
And uh, together with uh, Victor, who you saw earlier on, maybe has his camera on still, I can't see him. And he's helping out uh, very much with the in-between conference activities like this. So what we've done is that today we collaborate with ISPIM and we invited Maud to come share her experiences. And as I said, we've also invited uh, Pietra and uh, Fernanda to discuss with us. And I think we have Pietra here. Hi, Pietra. Nice to have you. We'll let you in in a second. And we also have Fernanda and uh, Victor. So very nice to have you here. And with that, I like to uh, leave the introduction and say welcome, Maud. Uh, Maud, you are from Amexi, where you are working with their um, efforts on finding applications for AI in additive manufacturing. Thank you, Elena. Hello, everybody. Thank you also to the automation region for organizing uh, today's webinar. Um, so yes, my name is Maud and I work at Amexi in Sweden uh, in trying to find application for artificial intelligence techniques on the additive manufacturing workflow. And uh, today I would like to present you a little bit what kind of challenges we faced in trying to, to make that uh, bridge between AI and additive manufacturing. Um, and I would be happy also to, to answer all questions that might come in uh, so we can have a, a discussion about uh, what it means in terms of innovation management. Um, so maybe I will share my screen now. And I, I would like first to maybe present you uh, Amexi. Um, so we are a um, research and development company based in Karlskoga in Sweden. Uh, and we work with a consortium of 11 entities that you can see here on this slide. We help them adopting the additive manufacturing technologies. So as you can see in a broad range of uh, industries going from transportation to, um, to energy or um, defense applications. And for them and also for external customers, we work on the research development in innovation. So we have three main uh, core areas. On the research side, uh, we work mainly in uh, developing uh, in doing studies and analysis on a broad uh, variety of topics. So going from material properties to um, uh, analyzing one type of uh, technology among the additive manufacturing technologies or doing some parameter development. So um, all kind of analysis and studies um, that uh, depending on the interests, then that research, those research studies usually lead us to to developing applications, so regarding uh, specific industry uh, uh, fields. So like we, we develop applications that are relevant for our owner groups or like for each um, uh, industry. So it's very, very, we develop the designs and the prints depending on, um, on every, every situation and every scenario what's relevant for each of them. And then what we call innovation is basically this process of going from identifying a concept and a potential application using additive manufacturing until really uh, having a ready to use product. And we also do that with uh, educational programs and trainings, meaning that we not only develop um, AM applications and designs, but we also want to train the industrial designers and managers in uh, adopting those uh, additive manufacturing guidelines. So we also recently launched a series of webinars and open trainings. So don't hesitate also to reach out uh, on those topics if you are interested in knowing more about Amexi. Um, and we have um, a set of machines in house that uh, both on the polymer and the metal side. But today, uh, since I, I work more uh, on, the, on the data side of the additive manufacturing, uh, I, I will talk more on the metal side since we've been investigating now uh, how to use um, AI related techniques on the for analyzing the data coming from the, the metal machines. So I've been working for a bit more than a year and a half as a program manager for AI 
in um, making that, that link and uh, identifying what kind of use cases we can have uh, using AI for AM. Um, so our main goal here was to bring together two still immature technologies that are the AI artificial intelligence on one side and the additive manufacturing. Um, and here what was interesting uh, was to actually understand the, the, the feasibility of bringing together two technologies, understand what technique was available from uh, the AI side and what, can, what feasible use cases we could um, tackle with those uh, available AI techniques. So it was in the first place to understand what kind of scope, uh, what point of interest we had uh, what kind of data we had from the from the AM uh, side, and what kind of AI techniques we could use to to bring value to the AM side. The general challenge and why we decided to go for AI uh, to, to and um, apply it to the AM workflow is to basically to tackle the qualification challenge that is mainly it is today the the main one. Um, for companies moving from prototyping to production. So uh, today we have all the, the, the players, the AM players have in hand traditional uh, qualification methods, such as um, the, the traditional ones or so the testing, the city scannings and several options that are either really costly or uh, time consuming. And that's a bit the reason why today um, machine manufacturers have developed new monitoring systems to basically with a batch, bunch of, um, of cameras and sensors and different hardware can collect a lot of data at a layer basis uh, and uh, collect data that is useful to understand what happened in the part that you print. Uh, so giving you an, understa an understanding of what kind of problems may have occurred in your part. And that's the reason why we see an interest in using AI techniques so that we could actually automate the analysis of all that data generated during the print, because today uh, this data is, is not being used for the reason that um, it would require one skilled operator to manually go through those files. And that's how uh, and where we see the value of automating that analysis of this layer by layer picture data that comes from those new systems. And to have maybe a concrete understanding of, of what we are using for this uh, those AI techniques and what kind of data we, we can take out from our 3D printed part. So if you take um, the one average part here of, for example, uh, 4,000 layers, this is a bit the kind of data you could collect from one print. You would collect a lot, a lot of the indications of process deviations that are perceived by the system and considered as problems. And you would collect a lot of pictures from different, giving you different types of information. So gi giving you optical information or information about um, the quality of your powder uh, and the way it has been spread over the fabrication plate. Um, and also a lot of sensor values. And basically that is all type of data that is generated over a print. And that is the data we want to analyze uh, to detect defects using AI related techniques. So, Maud, um, how come you uh, decided to focus on, on this specifically? So we wanted to, first of all, we identified that um, additive manufacturing being a digital industry. There are many opportunities for uh, using AI techniques since additive is a, is, it's a real digital thread. And and then in that initiative of using AI for IEM, uh, we had to focus first on, on one uh, first scope uh, to identify what was feasible and how to adopt a pragmatic approach uh, based on the data we, we got in-house and, um, and how we could uh, bring value and based on the data we had in-house. So basically it was the data that you had to decide where to start and did it also direct what type of, of AI and what type of machine learning, as I know you use, you decided to go for in the first one? Yeah, exactly. And since the, this uh, project is mainly uh, data oriented, 
it's really based on the available data um, that you have that you can um, decide what kind of AI techniques to use. And here, basically, the types of data that we got from the machines was mainly pictures, um, meaning that we needed to have a technique that can analyze, that can perform image analysis and uh, uh, visual recognition. Um, and then the other main constraint that we got is that since the additive manufacturing industry is still quite young, um, we have very few labeled data, meaning that when we want to generate defects in a path, uh, it, it's really hard to have uh, actually um, data with the targeted defects uh, already available. So, I mean, we, we, we have that, that um, those two main constraints to, to deal with pictures and to deal with unlabeled uh, data. So that's the reason why we, we used uh, um, semi-supervised um, um, deep learning to actually manage to do something out of this input data that we got. It's really interesting. I, I think we have two, uh, two questions in the chat. Uh, do you like me to take them now? Or do you like to continue with the presentation? Oh, we can definitely take questions. Okay, so the first one is from Eileen to everyone. I think we have someone who's unmuted as well. Uh, it says, could you explain a bit about how you collect data? Are the machines open to extract the data? Uh, is this a vendor specific solution? Parts of it, I think you've already uh, answered, but. Yes, um, I mean, since today we have many in-house, the, the EOS uh, M290 machines, we decided to uh, extract first the data from those systems. So it's really system dependent, the way you can extract the data. Um, although you can still change some, some features like scale, you can you can change the way you extracted the, the pictures, but it's, the way you collect the data is really dependent from the, the way the machine systems and softwares has, have been designed. And that was also one of the main uh, uh, things that uh, limited our scope um, since we, we, we are not so flexible in the way we could actually extract uh, data from the machines. Mm. I see. And then we have a question from Antonio, uh, one of our colleagues from the Eastern community says, Hi, Maud. To what extent is AI helping to define quality post-production or monitoring process conditions to prevent quality issues before they happen? And I think this is something that you will actually uh, uh, explain to us deeper. So this could be a good start on that. Yeah, um, so the, the, the way we perform this analysis now is uh, offline after we extracted the data but we aim at um, being able to do this analysis online uh, on the flow and directly detect defects happening in the print. And basically the way we want to do that uh, by developing our proof of concept today is to, so we based our analysis on the input data offline once we extracted it after a print. Uh, so we cannot now perform an analysis online yet. And using deep learning uh, algorithms that are trained to recognize the defect features from that input data, we hope to perform a clustering of that input data set um, and be able to cluster by type of defect the, the indications of process deviations that are perceived by our systems. Meaning that uh, our idea here using um, deep learning techniques is to first structure the data set uh, to match the different data to, to the other, meaning that since we have different types of source um, data, so coming from different uh, monitoring systems like optical and um, powder. Um, so the, the first thing that this um, model would do is to match those input data set with each other and then to structure the database to actually be able to, to understand what it can um, recognize and what kind of features it can detect and then hopefully when you do that matching and when you correlate those different input data set, we want to recognize different clusters. Um, so showing you different uh, defects. Um, and the more we have data to train the model, the more we can uh, detect defect patterns. And then once trained enough, the, enough, the idea is to be able to process any kind of non-labeled job data um, with the model. And then the model would recognize um, defects based on what it has learned during the training phase. 
And, and uh, I mean, we, we are uh, well aware of that data is everything here. If you don't have data and don't have data of good quality, it's, it's very difficult to work with. Has that been a, a challenge for you? Uh, except from that, the, the limitations you described that you need to work with what you have. But so the, the main challenge was to, to collect enough data to be able to, to train the model. And that was always a, a thing that we need to, to, to push from the beginning uh, because it's, um, it's based on what uh, job, what, what kind of parts we print with all machines. Um, the, and, and then it's not all the data that we can collect um for different reasons like because in the end since we are looking here for defects in the print uh, when we have a successful job that shows no defect it's data that that is basically useless for the analysis so we we also um, need some time to provoke defects in a print so to actually have a data set that shows problems to analyze and so I would say that the data collection part was the, the most challenging and it's not like when you want to analyze uh, when you want to train a model to to detect, for example, aircraft or things like that, then you would have a lot of um, image banks already available that you can just uh, train the model with. So you just have to to, to go on uh, some uh, images bank and um, and take every aircraft picture that you find. Here, the problem is that we have to train the model uh, in, in learning about something that is really specific to additive manufacturing, meaning that we want to train the model, for example, to recognize uh, porosity. And that's really hard to find already available um, optical tomography pictures showing porosity. So since it's a very specific scope we are training the model with, um, our main problem was to actually have this training uh, data like to, to use for the model. Yeah, but, but you have, since before, an experience from, from creating collaborations around this uh, training place, right? Yes, so the idea that we got basically um, at Amixi is to use internal data set that comes from the machine, uh, but also call for action to, to other additive manufacturing data users that who also had uh, data in-house, but either didn't know how to use it or simply uh, wouldn't have the time to 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 really look into analyzing those data. So we actually called for partners um, and who could share data with the same formats coming from the same systems and the same machines. And that was a way for us to to extend the data set um, and and be able to resume or um, or deep learning training. And that's a bit uh, the basically the phase of extending our data data set that we that we just concluded. Now, um, so we had for the initial input data set for the first development, the number of 27 jobs and the corresponding um, optical tomography pictures and other types of pictures and data. Uh, and here we were stuck in that development or we were li really limited to what we could collect in house. So that's the reason why we decided to go for, for um, external partners sharing um, non-critical data from the same uh, formats and systems and in exchange for um, for us sharing results on the on the training once done. And today we basically tripled the the input data set that we have thanks uh, thanks to those partners and this partner network and also our internal collection that we that we continued. Yes, and I think this is very interesting. And at least I have Priya worked with people who wanted to share data and discussed it. But it, it has been a struggle because there have been different issues and people haven't known how to overcome it. How did you make people feel, I don't know, comfortable with, with sharing data? So we decided to be really transparent on, on the, the problem that we were facing and just saying that um, it, we basically just need um, um, non-critical data that could show potentially different uh, situations in prints, so different defects. And then we were really clear that the data would only be shared with Amixi in exchange for other types of, uh, of um, pulsations, uh, but no data would be shared with third party participants or um, any in interaction with other participants would only be possible through a forum that we also put online in that context. So um, we were really clear on uh, 
on who that data would be shared with, and, and there would be no correlation made between the input data shared by the, by the partner and the way it has influenced the model training. Hmm. I see. And has it worked well to, to collaborate in, in the later stages when you started to use the data? Um, yes, I would say that we got a lot of um, um, traction and uh, uh, we got 14 companies involved and, and then we realized that sometimes even though the participants had maybe the same systems, uh, they maybe didn't print the, the jobs using the same material or the same metal. And since we want to stick with one um, uh, metal first, uh, we sometimes we, we couldn't really use the, the different types of metal. So sometimes it was a question of format and so on, but it's always data that we can keep and use for further scopes when we try to when we decide to broaden a bit the the scope of the of the analysis. So I would say it was it was really nice also to extend the analysis based on what uh, input data we we got from the participants and also these those collaborations brought us to to open up other topics. Um, such as doing some specific scans or comparing other types of data or including testing data or uh, so really about uh, broadening, broadening up the, the scope of the analysis. This is really cool. So, so what have you, uh, what would you say that you have found? What, what applications are the, the most important that you see today for AI here? Um, I think for AI using AM is definitely on, on the on the defect analysis and we focus now on the laser powder bed fusion, but you could basically have um, a use case on using AI for every step of the additive manufacturing workflow since basically for each step, so data preparation, fabrication or uh, post-processing testing, you have uh, all those steps generate um, data that are different from depending on, on the where you are in the workflow. So uh, you could basically find scopes of using artificial intelligence techniques um, in a different way um, and apply it to those different uh, data types. So uh, you could also decide to uh, use it for simulation and some simulation tools that are AI powered, powered already exist, uh, but you could decide to use it also to compare the CAD file to the to the final um, print, or like you would have a lot of different use cases how to how to use AI. This is really interesting. And when you go from because now you found so many possible applications, have you started to implement them? So today we are not in the implementation phase for the for this specific um, project, but we are already using some AI powered uh, simulation tools, for example. Uh, and then you have uh, actually a lot of already existing uh, tools that uh, use AI on the design generation part, for example, or, um, or on other like parameter developments or so. So actually more and more AI based tools exist for the, for the additive manufacturing technology. Yeah. And, and I know since we talked be, before that you said that one of the, the uh, challenges that you met has not been so much about the technology, but the the, uh, the organizational issues and, and the people and the readiness to, to work with it. Could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, exactly. I would say from like the, the, basically the main challenge is a bit everything that's around the pure deep learning development. Um, so today we work with Peltarion uh, on the on the development, but then the main challenge, or like one of the big challenges, is to actually prepare everything that's around. So perform that data collection, uh, uh, evaluate the model, um, make sure the the outcomes from the model are relevant from a additive manufacturing point of view. So to bring also all the experts to kind of do this um, human in the loop approach, where we validate the model of the the, the outcomes of the model uh, and so on. So it's actually everything that's around it is also uh, is also quite challenging, and that's also the the, the interesting part of of it. <laughs> yes, isn't it so? <laughs> the the challenges are the interesting part. And I know you you uh, you've been before before you came to Maxi. You've also worked with uh, digitalization and uh, 
uh, the use uh, of new novel technologies like this. How, do you recognize the challenges in these projects you have here from the ones that you've been before? And can you tell us briefly, what have you done before? Um, before I was mainly working in the transportation industry. So how to use also those uh, AI uh, systems for, for example, autonomous vehicles and, and so on. Um, and the thing you can uh, find that is common between all possible applications of AI is uh, basically what standards to develop, or I would say what uh, policies to develop to be able to deploy, to deploy those technologies um, in the use case you, you want. So uh, once you, you've found a use case, and even once you've developed a prototype that can work, then I would say the, 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 the main thing is about developing standards so that you can actually um, make sure you have uh, a certified and a secured and safe way of using uh, AI. So, yeah. Okay, so is, is this a large part of the work you do here now, working with the standards and the, the certifications? That's something we are looking into already at the even though we are still in the early early stage of the development, but we think it might be useful to to start looking into it now that we are in the beginning of the development, um, so that we don't get uh, stuck when we realize that there is no standard to actually be able to use such an AI based tool, especially when it comes to qualification. So um, we are, I think, for us, it's it's really uh, interesting to start looking into um, the, the the standard aspect of it to to make sure that at the end of the line, um, end users can actually um, utilize those tools. Mm. And uh, uh, because um, we didn't talk so much about it, but uh, when we first discussed, you described Maxi as, if you were the uh, innovation, the R&D lab for, for the companies that has built the Maxi. Uh, and Maxi is actually formed to do things like this, uh, right? Uh, so are these people who formed a Maxi, they are the end users to a large extent for you? Yes, exactly. I mean, we, we basically develop um, those tools together with, the, with them. And I mean, uh, it, we try to make it as application specific as possible, meaning that uh, whenever they, they want to try and see, uh, okay, can you analyze this job data with the tool that you're creating and what, what could be the value that you bring in one application? So. For us, it's really important also to co-develop that um, and find already applications, even again at, at an early stage of development. And in general, all the research we do and all the innovations that we develop on the additive manufacturing side, but also on this AI to AM side, is really focused uh, to, to towards their applications and our uh, on a group. Really interesting. Uh, we had a question from uh, GLA. Uh, she asked, how did you address the ethics issue, especially the ownership of data and new findings, the, the within brackets innovations? So the ethic issues, I mean, when the partners shared they, their data, it was clear that the data remained uh, their property. Mm -hmm. um, and it was only uh, us using the data as uh, as a reference data for to train the, mo the model, but then we, we would not own the data at all. Uh, it's like if you have a catalog of defects uh, in a data set and you use it to, to train a tool, but uh, uh, it's not our property. Um, and then again, I mean, there is no um, use or we don't share the data to any other third party. Yeah, that was actually what you told us about before, right? Uh, yes, um, it's uh, we we really um, structured the, the the use of those data. Mm -hmm. Have there been anything that you did not expect when you started? Any any findings, any results that were outside what did you did expect? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's always a le learning process where we where we discover we face sometimes obstacles, but we try to find solutions to, to go with it. So uh, it's always things that we discover and we didn't expect. Um, it was also um, exciting to see what would come out from this uh, deep learning uh, analysis because we, 
it, we were not sure if the approach itself would uh, would be validated. So uh, I would say at every step we have th we have things that um, are not planned or that we didn't expect in the beginning. So, so uh, what would be your your number one advice to people starting up like that? I think the advice to go for an AI project uh, is to to choose first a scope that is small enough that you can start concrete, uh, but then having the the overall picture of where you actually want to go and what kind of value you want to bring. Um, and then I would say, say it's also about making sure what you develop from one side, meaning let's say for, for the AI, from the AI side, always makes sense um, from your industry perspective. So if you only develop things that are feasible from an algorithm, but that don't make sense for the operators, uh, for then then it's, uh, it's a bit um, out of scope. Well, I, I would say you, you always need to make sure you answer to an actual problem um, and that even though it's still early development that maybe so, somehow it will be used um, and useful for for those who actually deal with the machines um, on the additive manufacturing side. Has that been, uh, how, how have you worked to ensure that these people, as you say, that are close to the, the real problems of today, uh, how do you ensure that they are involved in the process and, and feel comfortable with the development? We try to, to make those two worlds communicate with each other um, to understand uh, the one side's um, constraints related to the technology and the other side's um, interests and needs and always make the two communicate. Uh, also, we, every time we train, or like last time we trained the model and when we will do it um, in the near future, we always make sure to involve the, the experts from, from the AM side. Mm. That's really interesting. This is very close to, I don't know if I interrupted you in your presentations. Uh, I figure maybe you have more slides. Um, or have we been through them? That may be on the challenges. Um, yes, please do so. That's interesting. So the different things that we realized along the way, um, I mean, we already mentioned that, but I would say it was to build a big database that could be strong enough and powerful enough to, to train the, the model. So generating enough job data in-house. And also since we want to detect defects in the laser powder bed fusion process, uh, we needed to make sure that we would cover in the input data set enough um, defects situations. Um, then it's about, it was about labeling or data. So when I mean labeling um, is a bit uh, uh, how to, kind of guide the model in recognizing recognizing what we want him to, to recognize. Um, so let's say we had a lot of non-labeled data and um, we also included in the in the training data set some, um, some jobs for which we knew already what defect happened. And then uh, um, that means we, we threw in the model some, some already um, annotated data. So to kind of guide the model in, in um, for the training um, and then maybe uh, not only um, having enough data but also being sure of what scope you, you chose and being making sure to keep consistent in the long run so also that's um, that was quite an, a challenge to to make sure that what you have at uh, day one of development and the, the the extraction capabilities that you have you will still have it at the end of the development to kind of keep the same um, data set consistent. Um, and how did you do that? Because that is, as you say, I mean, that has to be a, a great challenge actually. So that's always um, learning by doing process, progress, I would say. So first of all, we are not quite sure how to, what to choose as a format, for example, and what kind of scale to choose when we extract the pictures. And then um, it's it's really by discussing it with our different partners and uh, by trying to see what would make the most sense and how we could detect the most uh, um, things, then we, we decided and we narrowed down uh, along the way. Mm. 
And I think I remembered from we talked before that you said that the unsupervised uh, algorithms that you use actually found patterns that you uh, on their own, things that you didn't uh, have there that you assumed it to find. Uh, do I remember that right? Yes, exactly. Um, and that's the reason why we combine labeled and non-labeled jobs. Uh, so non-labeled to see what the model will detect by itself. So if the model, if the model would recognize some uh, patterns uh, with the computer vision. Um, and then the, on the label side is really to guide and to help a bit the model to, to, to guide the model to recognize what we want it um, to, to see. Mm -hmm. But also combination and uh, basically the more data you have, uh, the less you, or the more you can perform unsupervised. And here again, it goes back to our problem that we are limited in terms of what input data set we can get. And uh, in that sense, um, it was good to help the model with some label data. It's really interesting. Um, I figured maybe we should allow Fernanda and Pietra to join us. Would that be okay for you? That sounds perfect. Okay, great. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you, uh, and for you who have not met them, uh, Pietra, she appeared first on my screen, so I'll start with you. Pietra is uh, a professor of strategy and management from Eastern Switzerland University of Applied Science at St. Gallen. And she has her research focus on the intersection of innovation, strategy and management. And I think both you and uh, Fernanda very much uh, embodies the something that's very typical of innovation, and that is the interdisciplinarity, the multidisciplinarity, because just like with AI, innovation and innovation management are things that needs to be applied. You often have, uh, you need domain uh, expertise also, as here with additive manufacturing. So uh, warmly welcome, Petra. Oh, hello, everyone. Thank you. And we also have Fernanda with us. Fernanda is, as I said in the beginning, she's the CEO and one of the uh, founding partners of Next Agents. Uh, and like Petra, she's also having her expertise within innovation management. And her intersection is more between design, business and innovation. And besides the, the um, managerial and uh, consultancy parts, she's also teaching at both Stockholm School of Economics and Stockholm Entrepreneurship. And she's also a design industry leader at Hyper Island and have very recently uh, published a book on AI leadership for boards. And I think both your areas are extremely interesting in this setting. So um, when you listen to Maud, do you recognize, uh, do you feel familiar with the innovation process and the challenges? Do you want to go first, Petra? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So um, I would say yes, I think there's a lot of things that remind me of the innovation process, although I have to admit, you're, you're rather a startup than an established firm. So I think that's a big advantage. A lot of established firms have the problems that they um, have difficulties capturing, understanding um, the kind of, I, I, I would almost use the term disruptive technology. So, and I think that's actually what AI is. So, and, and, and we see that there's a lot of difficulties in, in understanding and seeing um, what the change might be like for their processes and for their entire business model, um, for their internal processes and so on. So, and therefore I would say, Yes, that's a typical innovative business that uh, you're describing right now. And Fernanda, do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's actually super interesting, Petra, that you brought up this uh, uh, relation to more established businesses, because I had highlighted here, you know, big letters to ask more exactly this when, when you're talking about, you know, making sure that you have a problem and that it will be useful to those uh, uh, in the machines. I think that one thing that I see in my practice uh, working with more established uh, uh, businesses is that sometimes the decision-making is very uh, far away from those working in the field. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of the difference between what could be said 
the, the, the kind of the doers and the thinkers. And sometimes the decision is, is happening on, on a very different level. So it can be that someone on, on let's say a board or a leadership team uh, makes a decision about implementation. Okay, this, this sounds like a good you know, business case but then how to actually translate that into the operational side. So I think it was interesting, uh, Mona. Maybe you could also uh, say a few more words about that. Do you have any tips on how to identify these um, jobs to be done, this good problem? How to identify a good problem to address with AI to start with? <laughs> yeah, thank you for bringing that topic. Because it's, it's, we are in a very uh, lucky situation at Amixi since uh, we, we, have, we are already this, uh, entity that uh, brings together different industrials. And uh, so we are actually really close to them and to the, to the one who, who, who would potentially uh, see an interest in those, um, in those developments. So it's, it's really easy for us to get the, the requirements on how, what direction to take, how to develop the tools and so on. So, um, but I would say also we, are, we have that flexibility to, to develop a lot of different projects, uh, since we are still, uh, um, uh, yeah, the, we are 17 people. So it's a bit like we are this research department that can be agile and that can go to those uh, big companies that we have um, as owners and ask for, okay, how would you see the development for, for such a thing? So um, um, yeah, it's always that uh, kind of back and forth that we, we can easily do and, uh, and um, but I think it's also a way for those companies to 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 start um, seeing applications for all those technologies by themselves. So that's why we also do a lot of education uh, programs in that uh, in that sense. Because yeah. because I, I think that one of the biggest challenges of innovation management there's an eternal fight between mm -hmm. should you do uh, innovation in house or should you do it outside kind of skunk works. And it's always the challenge when working uh, with with a, a, you know a partner like Amexia, I would say, how to then bring that knowledge back to the organization and how to make sure that uh, what is developed is meaningful and, and valid for, for the organization. You mentioned earlier uh, that you do a lot of kind of co-development and that you try to have a, a, a close partnership with these organizations. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And um, it's it's basically our, our vision as a company to, uh, but more on the additive manufacturing side, really to to first uh, educate the, the engineers to have those guidelines so that they can launch projects by themselves. Uh, but then we also support them on the design, on the printing and so on. So it's uh, it's both um, a dynamic of, uh, of uh, knowledge sharing, uh, but also of uh, guiding them in the in being more and more independent using the technology. And, and it's a way that many established firms are trying to go these days, because the problem is very often if you have an established business model, an established line of thinking, established power um, structure and so on in the organization, there is building up something new. There's a conflict between the two ways that you go. And if you choose to work with an external organization, especially with a startup, I think the rules are more clear. So um, that's extremely important. And if you manage to do that, and if you manage to share, uh, we have talked about, uh, you have talked about sharing the data. I think that's pretty much the same about sharing the knowledge and who does what. And uh, that's, that's very valuable kind of cooperation. Yeah, and I mean, you realize also that uh, that people are open for it when you talk about collaboration. And once you, as long as you fix clearly, like who owns what and so on, um, people are really um, open to those kind of collaborations. So it's really, it's really nice also to see that uh, you can launch these kind of projects and have um, have some interest from from people who uh, who maybe are, are not used also to to open um, collaboration like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, just to build, just to build on what Petra was saying. Sorry to jump in. Uh, I think it's very interesting this aspect of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do want th th there's a bit of a dilemma, right? You do want to partner up to learn faster, to develop faster, to minimize risk, etc. 
But then the other side of it, uh, and kind of specifically talking about uh, from a, a leadership perspective and, and specifically about from a, a board perspective, you are uh, the ultimate responsible for what will happen in your business. And then you start having uh, um, uh, uh, other stakeholders that you also have to govern. Namely, you will get algorithms that are impacting your business and data that is impacting your business, but it, that it comes from the exterior, from these ecosystems. And then it really becomes a challenge also for the board to be able to, to govern all this. I mean, then you have to govern yourself, which is you know <laughs> quite a big task already, but then you also kind of have to keep an eye <laughs> on your partners and, and, and how they are doing things. And I think that one biggest challenge that uh, we have identified in, 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 in our research, uh, I, I, I've written this uh, uh, book together with um, Lisa Lot Engstam from the Ocean and uh, Robin Tegland from Chalmers. Um, it's really the risk aversion uh, from uh, boards and a lot of leadership teams um, be, because the, 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 the you are you are uh, um, um, if you take a certain innovation decision and you fail that's kind of on your cv but if you have a certain opportunity and you don't do anything about it you know no one knows <laughs> so you feel more comfortable in avoiding taking opportunities than actually uh, taking them and um, it, it's a challenge to push innovation in that context and and uh, uh, also AI and also additive manufacturing and other disruptive technologies. And, and I, I would like to add another point. What we have recognized is that many boards are missing the knowledge to really judge on, on what is going on. So especially in established firms, they, um, they're not trained in, in recognizing what AI can do and they have to judge right now on, on whether uh, an opportunity is a challenge or not, or whether it is an opportunity or not. And, and that's so difficult. So I would totally agree that the risk awareness and the risk avoidance are um, very important points. So um, Maud, I would be interested, have you recognized that as well? And what do you do with it? Yes, I think it's, um always a risk that you take when you want to innovate and um, try new things but then I think as long as you that, that's a bit going back to what I said with starting with small steps that whenever you start one step and you realize it's not going in the right direction then it's always easy to change a bit your direction and start over and then you didn't um, lose a lot you only gained uh, knowledge in the, in the process. So I think it's about showing the potential in every small step that you take. Um, but, but then, uh, and then the people in front of you might understand um, what can come out from, from that. And, and a lot of times it happens to be uh, greater potential benefits that, than actual risks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to bring up a comment here from the chat. Uh, Simval, and uh, he, she was writing uh, uh, around, you know, that great ideas don't really come from prescribed brainstorming sessions, this mm -hmm. kind of openness that uh, 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 there has to be idea capture kind of bottom up and, and, and top down to have a balance between these two. Um, I wonder, uh, uh, Maud, when we're talking about AI, um, uh, my, my, my experience and, and also building on what Petra said, uh, you know, general lack of knowledge from leadership when it comes to certain technologies such as AI. Um, when we have like an open, open program just to collect ideas, open innovation, and people contribute with, with uh, different ideas and, and, you know, suggestions. Um, do you have any, any, any ideas of how to select good ideas when it comes to AI and addi additive manufacturing? What could be good criteria? Like, okay, this sounds like a good idea because it touches upon these points. Do you have any um, suggestions how to select ideas, good ideas? <laughs> it's a big, big question. <laughs> it's a big question. I don't know if, uh, if I have um, enough experience to share on that, I'm sure. <laughs> Other people have more, but I mean, in our case, in, it was um, 
it was just about being uh, open to try it out and see what would make sense uh, from, from the data we got and, and all that. But but of course, uh, we we could have had like found better ideas uh, that we didn't go for. I mean, time will tell if we went for the right uh, direction. But a lot of experimentation, I think right there is a good um, tip already before making decisions test out and then make the decision based on some kind of knowledge created by testing, right? That's already a good tip right there to test things in advance. I also wanted to bring up another aspect. When Elena uh, invited me for the, for the panel uh, and she said AI and uh, additive manufacturing, I immediately started talking about sustainability. Um, and then it's not maybe so much the, the focus uh, 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 exactly on the process that you are doing now, Maud, but maybe looking into the future, because when talking about additive manufacturing, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the, um, the fact that you save so much on resources, you're, you're just really building kind of what you want. And then we add AI and mass customization to that, then you're really just building according to your needs. Um, I wonder if, if sustainability is, is something that is on uh, Amex's mind, how, how you discuss about it, if you have any ideas around it, how to bring that aspect to the discussion also. Yeah, I mean, we really believe that um, AM is a sustainable technology in the sense that, as you said, you don't, uh, like you only build for what you need, only use the material that you need. Um, and, and then that's also with all those digital um, and those data and every opportunity that comes with it, um, it's also a way to always optimize your, your processes and your production. Um, therefore, to, to, to do less um, iterations on the print, to, to lose less material, to do less crashes. Um, so when you avoid crash, you, avoid, you, you lose less material and all that. So um, yes, I think AM is a sustainable technology um, in a sense, by a sense. And I think uh, when we talked before, I think it's also very interesting because May is not from additive manufacturing. When you describe the difference of using AM to uh, ensure the quality of something that you've printed and doing it manually, uh, because when you do it manually, when you talked about this, you said you, you need to give the system data on defect pieces to ensure the quality, you actually have to break a, a number of these to, to ensure that, isn't that right? Here you can actually see the quality in every print layer. Yes, exactly. So that's, that's also with the idea of, um, of doing more, um, of doing prints that don't um, necessarily need to be, uh, uh, you don't need to iterate on the print uh, once you, once you realize that one print is, is going uh, wrong um, during the print, then you could just stop the print and avoid losing all that material and all that time and all that. So, um, but that's a bit the final goal of it. Um, today, we are not in the stage of being able to perform an online, an online analysis yet. Mm. What, what is required? What is the steps that you will need to take to come to the goal? I think the, the main one is to first have a ready to use model that you can just plug into an, a platform and uh, cover your workflow. And then that goes back to integration capabilities that um, you need to be able to integrate live uh, your model to, to the systems from the machines. And, and sometimes for, for simple API reasons, you're blocked um, and you cannot integrate or like the systems are not open enough. So it's, uh, but that's things that can be, that can be worked on. And I think we, we are also working towards, towards this integration um, um, and opening the systems. Mm. Uh, and something that I thought was so interesting when we talked about this was that you, uh, at least back then, talked about, and uh, we touched upon it several times here, was the, the trust in the organization and the people who's actually working with it in the traditional way, building the trust so that they, um, I don't know, feel comfortable uh, in what you're doing so that they are willing to adopt it. 
And I think this is very close to uh, both of you, what you're doing, but, but you, Peter, you're talking much about the, uh, the dominant logic that is built into an organization and how that one needs to, to change uh, to make us able to um, adopt and actually innovate uh, when it comes to digital um, and, and driven innovations. Because uh, if I read you right here, Maud, the, uh, there has been challenges, of course, in the tech side, but you are buying in algorithms and the tech maturity has not been the major um, issue. The, the tech is even, uh, sometimes it sounds like more mature than the organizations that should adopt them. Or, or uh, do I get you wrong? No, I mean, you're right. It's, it's definitely um, also one thing to, to, to first prove that it can work and, and try to convince people that have worked with traditional qualification methods all their career to kind of switch to the data-based tools. I mean, of course, we, we first have to, to evaluate those tools and see if it can be a, a reliable tool um, complementary to the quality, to the traditional methods. So it's, it's also maybe there is some sometimes some reluctance to use uh, data-based and AI-based uh, tools for especially when it comes to qualification for critical or less critical parts, but that's definitely something that is not uh, adopted yet. So, so I, I would be interested in to learn a little bit more about the re, uh, relationship between the technology and what it means for the organization. I think that's what you have meant, Helena. So um, is there anything that is different in your organization compared to a traditional organization that is not working with AI, uh, specifically focusing on that. So do you think in a different kind of way? Do you see the data in a leading position within your organization? Or what does it mean for, um, for organizing around data, for working with it? Oh yeah, so it, it, it means yeah. Of course, it means to adopt new tools and uh, to be to be ready to change a bit your your ways of working. So when you implement a new system, then uh, of course it takes a lot of time to for people to accept it and to kind of find find their way of working around it. Um, but I mean, we are since we are uh, an applied research uh, company. For us, it's also really nice to kind of. Um, try out some systems uh, internally, see um, see how it can work, and and then like we are also in a way um, a playground to try out new systems. Uh, um, so it's although it might be it's always a bit difficult when you when you have to change uh, ways of working, of course. Mm -hmm. So it's again playing with the technology, not expecting right from the first instant that it works, but it's rather to go um, ahead with small steps and also to accept that there might be a failure from which you can also learn. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was just thinking, uh, Petra, now that you were talking about organizations and, and kind of other ways of working, I was thinking about tacit knowledge mm -hmm. and kind of how to make AI around tacit knowledge. Mm -hmm. So a few years back, I was working in a Storenzo, which is a big a pulp paper to do producer, renewable materials, packaging, etc. And there were these amazing uh, workers, I, uh, you know, I, love them. Someone that could just go to a machine, take a sheet of pulp and look at it, taste it and say, ah, there's something wrong, you know, uh, there. And and to, to, it's super interesting once, uh, um, and again, I guess, I guess it, it depends on, on this kind of holistic perspective over the production process or the innovation process and and kind of the the uh, um the narrow perspective on it and and i guess it's interesting how we look in in this case uh okay the the detail of of, of a, a specific piece that might go into a certain machine later on and then also the 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 the, the tacit knowledge of someone that has worked on it for you know um how, how to gather that and, and how to make AI around that. Mm -hmm. I, I would even go a step further. I think 
tacit knowledge is one big part, but it's also what we have seen, it's a different kind of conceptualizing the organization. So the, the organization works in a different way. And that's why I have mentioned the term disruption beforehand, because we know that um, whenever there is a, a new technology that might lead to a kind of disruption, especially established firms have problems in, in understanding, in seeing and in being aware of what happens. So they don't understand the new logic, the new system behind it. And my impression is that this is exactly the same for working with data or working with AI. So it's a new kind of logic. Uh, Helena, you have used the term that, that we use very often in science and in, in strategy, a kind of dominant logic that is thinking, but also acting and organizing in a, in a different kind of way. And established firms do not really understand it because they're still in their own old established kind of thinking. So it's, it's a different world and we need a kind of translator between um, the different uh, worlds. So, so Maud, I would, would be interested in, do you think this is also the case for your firm, especially when working uh, with your partners, the established partners? I think that's a really interesting point. And uh, we, I mean, we, we develop the relationships with every owner uh, so that they, they can um, understand what, uh, how they, they, they can cooperate with us and um, on what field they can um, start adopting new technologies and all that. So, I mean, we, uh, we, ha we have good, uh, good collaborations with them and they are always open to, to investigate new topics and so on. So it's also a unique setup that we have um, with having this already um, implemented consortium for knowledge sharing and uh, it's kind of um, externalized research and development entity. So by, by definition, they are open to do projects. And I think that's, that's a really a unique setup where uh, where big companies have agreed to to all together um, invest in in one entity to investigate further one technology or several technologies around the AM. So I think that's a unique setup, and that's um, that's a, a setup that we could replicate for also other types of uh, technologies. So here it's about AM, um, also AI, but it can be about any any type of innovation that can be kind of um, Mm -hmm. um, organized that way. Yeah, and I think that uh, I'm going to jump in for one. I think it's very interesting, and, and both uh, we started, Peter, and, and how you perceive mode. And um, when talking to you before before the webinar mode, uh, Peter, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm mixing you up. We were talking about the fact that, uh, as you say, both we have that you you are addressing now more that you have the the buy-in from the organizations, and you have this sort of very close collaboration with you already have agreed and you have a bridge in, so to say, where you bridge different organizations. And you, Pepe, also addressed the, the need of when you do something very new, where you don't have this logic yet, you need examples and building that. And we have a question uh, from, um, let me see, uh, here we go, from Erlin. And, and she said, this is this came earlier, so it's uh, addressing a bit of what we discussed before, which is, uh, she said, um, I think you're on, to, uh, on point uh, on your analysis. Surprisingly, uh, production is not the top interest of producing companies. Therefore, it can be difficult to create interest in these kinds of projects and initiatives. Digitalization groups or CDOs often does not get enough mandate to create change. And I think this is something that is interesting that uh, we're talking about, uh, we're crossing borders of organizations, but we're also crossing layers of, of mandate and, and the, the type of uh, dominant logic you're talking about, Peter, has also different layers, just like you and your research, Fernanda, discuss about the boards. We have different people that needs to be on board. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, do, do you, uh, do you see that? Do you have any tips on how to to involve the entire organization, so to say? 
I'm leaving the question open. <laughs> In general, <laughs> well, I I, uh, um, I I I can jump in uh, and and say a few things from a board perspective and and based on on the interviews we have conducted on the research we have been doing, but also on the continuous work. I mean, we're still keeping contact with boards and kind of uh, building on that. Um, so. I, I think that the effort is, uh, uh, it needs to happen across the entire organization. Um, boards also themselves need to innovate how they work and, and how they uh, um, interact with the organization. Uh, and the organization themselves also need to uh, find new processes to deal with, uh, uh, with the challenges for, from these technologies. Now, what I think is interesting, and I, I swear I'm not saying this because I work in innovation management, uh, so I'm not trying to you know, sell my fish here, but what I think is interesting is that the capabilities about implementing AI and the capabilities for innovation ma management are, are, are ter terribly similar, right? So the kind of mindset that you need in order to experiment, to explore, to be out in the market looking for trends, what's happening, this, all, all these are common both to uh, implementing new technologies such as AI and innovation management. So. Yeah. Don't you think, Jeff, you know, that, that is because, as we said in the beginning, both those areas of, of profession requires um, a domain uh, knowledge as well. You need to apply them somewhere. Don't you think that makes something very common to these? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I, I think so. But also, uh, uh, and tapping a bit with what uh, Petra was saying, it's this idea that you need to rethink how you do things. The, the traditional organization needs to rethink itself. And uh, um, if not now, then when? So, so this is the right time to take that initiative. And once you are kind of doing this transformation process, I think it's extremely interesting to think that you are making an investment in both areas at the same time. Because the way of thinking, the mindset, the 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 attitude uh, is is very similar. So when you are implementing a new technology, um, the kind of the kind of uh, business cases, um, sometimes they are around innovation. They are around uh, just bringing a new, let's say, traditional innovation, as in bring a new product or service to market. Uh, but maybe they can be when it comes to uh, improvement of an internal process, uh, mm -hmm. such as this uh, example. But the way how you come around to do it, it's very similar. So I think that what we need to understand is that um, boards need to have a different way to address these challenges, to be more open uh, to, to the current trends. Um, strategy is not something that happens once per year, but is something that you need to revisit constantly. And that strategy needs to be informed by your innovation strategy also. So it's not something just that leadership deploys to the organization and you know go and do it, but rather also what the organization t teaches back to the board, as in the knowledge gathered in these experiments, for example. So how, how to build good uh, loops within our organization so the knowledge is available to everyone at, at, at the different layers. And I'm convinced that once knowledge is, is available, then action is also easier. Uh, if, if boards have better information, they will act upon it in a better way and then if operations also have better information you know etc so it, it kind of i would say gets the machine going uh, uh the machine rolling so I, I would totally agree to you fernanda and I, I would even add that innovation has always something to do with changing the situation to mm -hmm. Uh, go for new horizons to check out what happens and but you don't know if it will be successful and that's a big danger also um, that that is connected to every kind of innovation activity so and we have recognized whenever it comes to AI or using data um, there should be a kind of 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 of, of uh, of change agent within the organization. In smaller company, very often it's on the top of the organization. It's the owner, it's the CEO, and it's a person who understands what is different, uh, who can transfer the knowledge 
in, into the entirety of the organization, but also who make sure that people are not afraid of the change. So mm -hmm. I've heard very often that people um, are fearing that they won't have any more the, the required knowledge or capabilities to work with AI or with data, and they don't know what would be the consequences for their own job. So um, to agree on something that um, that 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 uh, that makes you giving up your job might be very difficult. So there's also a kind of certainty that needs to be um, assured within the company. Yeah, absolutely, and, and and that people get some help in in in, in working with the technology, and yeah. that's an an opportunity. That's also what Maud has explained to to go for the opportunities to have small successes um, to see what is working well, what is more difficult, and then you can go on in small small set, uh, steps. That's important just to get started. Yeah, I, I yes. think- And I think that is one of the beautiful things with Amexi actually more, because what you've done is not only that you have a buy-in from the organizations that is actually forming you, uh, but you also work with, as you said, the, the educations for people and, uh, and the activities that I believe you do uh, that might be uh, by practical reasons, but also I assume build these kind of buy-ins and trust as well. Uh, so I guess that is a very strategic decision for you, isn't it? I mean, we definitely um, work on a daily basis with them. So they, they are not only owning the Amixi, it's they are our direct uh, customers and we, we've developed, uh, I mean, since we work on several projects and topics, uh, we have developed nice uh, ways of working together. Yes. I, I was just going to say, uh, Elena, uh, uh, it's very interesting, this idea, uh, and you and I, we have discussed this, this idea of this mystifying uh, AI. Uh, I, I think that it, what is happening is also, and feel free to kick my ass now with what I'm going to say next. But, you know, it, it has been... Uh, uh, a discourse that has been very uh, uh, tech dominated uh, in, in many, ex to a great extent. Uh, and this really uh, scares the rest of the folks, right? So uh, I, uh, a, good, a good friend of, of mine, Catherine Mironok from uh, Singularity University, she, she has a good way to describe this. She is saying, you know what? You don't, to, to design a car and to understand how a car works and how to, and to drive a car, you yourself don't need to be a mechanical engineer to build the car. You just need to know enough how to drive it, right? Uh, and she's making the same parallel when it comes to AI. And I really like that idea that, okay, we, we absolutely need to have the tech on board also, but I think it's important to empower the organizations to feel confident and starting to, to, to try out and, and test. So basically go for a test run and you know take your driver's license when it comes to AI kind of thing, but still feel empowered to at least uh, uh, try to do it rather than just feeling scared and, and not doing anything about it. And I think this is a bit related Maud, to what you said in the beginning. I think it was you, you were mentioning uh, that uh, maybe smaller organizations are somehow uh, falling behind from bigger, bigger organizations when it came to AI, right? Or I don't know if it was you, Helena, saying this, but someone was mentioning this. And I guess it's because of, yeah, this um, not feeling empowered to go and test it somehow. So, yes, so that was me. We oh. <laughs> uh, oh, was <laughs> yeah, never mind. Um, we have recognized that in a study that um, smaller firms were falling behind because the, the larger firms simply have um, more resources, and mm. so they, they they tend to to go for a new technology. And the smaller firms they're more hesitating. They're recognizing what is going on, but they have difficulties in using the potential. And mm. and it's it's always the idea. Well, today it's important. In five years, it will be very important, and we have still enough time. And I think that's that's the huge uh, thing that might go wrong. Yes. So, and also what, one thing I would like to add on this is that we often mystify the AI um, technology and, uh, and uh, its possible um, consequences. But in the end, when you, you really try to make it operational and uh, to start projects uh, using AI, you realize it's, uh, 
it's uh, you have to start small and i mean it's it's it goes back to a lot of organizational stuff and uh it's often not really threatening to anyone or anything um especially when you just uh, do this whole groundwork of trying to see how you can even apply it i mean it's uh, we are very very far from from having ai as a threat um at all yes and and time is flying so um i'm gonna wrap up just a little bit here um been great having you here and i think what you addressed what you all addressed here in the the end uh, a couple of interesting things is uh, first uh, you peter talking about how the small companies lag behind we see that a lot that there is a a, a threshold actually to to the companies need to assess but we also know from an innovation management perspective that sometimes the large companies with all their resources and very rigid structures also have a tendency to lag behind when start, start, things start to change and transform. So I guess uh, we can expect to see both in the future. I think you, Maud, is also here in the end addressing something that we hear very often when we look at what is going on in research at the moment when it comes to AI and especially AI adoption. You are you are on a development side, you, you are innovating. But when we see the research and the papers that is published on um, companies trying to adapt uh, uh, innovative AI technology, is that you see that many people uh, shoot for the moon and then are not capable of actually managing these. Uh, and that might be sometimes it is the uh, the boards that are naive, they they um, or, or managers they uh, initiate projects where the organisations are not yet. So I guess taking it in small steps is something uh, very important. Do you do you have something a last thing to add that you like to to give the the people uh, before we close today? Something you you think we should have talked about that we have not, or something that wraps it up. Maud, would you like to start? Um, I think the, I mean, first of all, thank you so much. Um, and uh, I would say the last thing I would like to, to say is like, uh, I very much agree with the fact that AI is about uh, knowledge transfer and uh, everything you said earlier about uh, um, how you have an expert that is that would perceive right away something uh, technical. And then it's about training a model to perceive the same uh, thing more or less. So. Um, I think AI is really a great opportunity to to do this knowledge transfer on the and then it can be applied to to any kind of uh, of technology or industry and I think in that sense it's a it's a great um, can be a great tool. Fernanda, do you have any any last words? <laughs> I just have here a reflection. So I was looking here to the chat and uh, Seema, yes. she uh, uh, made here a comment, you know, could AI uh, and uh, additive manufacturing uh, as a sustainable technology raise more women engagement in 3D printing uh, industry? And, and I would say, uh, uh, not only talking about women from a gender diversity perspective, talking about diversity in, in general. Uh, I'm talking about different ethnic backgrounds. I'm talking about different ages. Uh, yeah, different experiences. Again, and, and looking back at uh, the experience from uh, um, innovation management, diversity brings value. And uh, I think it's the same thing when it comes to certain technologies such as AI. The more diverse team, uh, you avoid a lot of bias biases when implementing the technology. So I think that there is something really, uh, there, there is an opportunity, there, there's a really a, a shifting moment again, uh, that I think it's very important that we see the value of diversity uh, in general, and really try to make that uh, part of the implementation of of AI, disruptive technologies, innovation, diversity as an aspect for value. Yes, indeed. Thank you. And Petra, um, briefly before summing up, do you have anything you'd like to add? So I would like to add something that is not new at all, but something that is very important for innovation management, for strategy, and now for the specific use of new technologies like AI that we should constantly question 
what seems to be self-evident. So I think that's that's what brings us further and what helps us to cope with new situations that we have right now in so many circumstances. And I think that's what we should keep and what is probably the most important capability within firms. Question, be open to diversity, to sustainability, to technologies and to every opportunity that we have. So go for it. That's a good, that's a very good way to end things today. And I'd like to say thank you to all of you. Thank you, especially to Maud, uh, Pietra and Fernanda who has been talking so much now that I think you, you're gonna enjoy shutting your cameras and microphones off. Thank you very much to, to Anna as well, who's um, made this uh, possible for us by, by running the webinar uh, and taking care of all the technical practicalities. And to Victor who, who's made this uh, possible and helps out. Uh, there are some questions that we haven't been able to, to answer yet, uh, but we, um, we take them with us and I hope that you, if you have any questions, if you'd like to get in contact you, someone asked whether you, Maud, are working also with uh, universities and research on AAR. I think you've seen the question and please, I know you do. Or if anyone has an interest, we, we would love to continue the discussions about the intersections about technology and innovation management. Please get in contact both with us at Automation Region and with us, and you can contact me uh, at uh, the ISPIN or, or MOD or any one of us. We'd love to continue the discussion and set up new uh, meetings where we can discuss. So uh, thank you very much for today and hope you have a great afternoon.